So our first speaker today is Hope Michelson, Associate Professor in ACE. Take it away, Hope. I'm gonna talk about a problem which is persistent and important in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which relates to underuse of mineral fertilizer. So I'm gonna give you a new insight into a problem that you know, has been persistent in the region. I'm gonna show you the sort of trends of that persistence. Um, and I'm gonna talk about some new work we're doing. So this is, this is work with three graduate students, you know, five other professors. There's a whole bunch of people that are involved here. Um, and I, I can mention them specifically at the end. Okay, so in terms of motivation, this is a really nice graph um, of uh, the number of people in extreme poverty going back to 1990 um, with projections through 2030. Sorry, I'm myself. Um, and so the, the sort of important thing to take away from this slide is you know, the majority of people that are poor in the world today and this is extreme poverty, so this is the $1.90 per day um, PPP adjusted international line. The majority of people that are in that extreme poverty category are in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that is expected to persist through the next 15 to 20 years, right? So the, the challenges that I'm talking about are challenges related to persistent poverty and food insecurity. And the issues in Sub-Saharan Africa really become the dominant issues if we're gonna talk about um, the, the sort of landscape of poverty in the coming 10 to 20, to 20 years. Okay, so this is a little fuzzy. It's taken from a really important report that was done by the World Bank, their, develop, their annual development report, which focused on agriculture in 2008. And um, the, the, the impetus for that report was thinking about the role of agriculture in development and in poverty reduction. So this is a graph that I use in my undergraduate course. I also use in my graduate course. I trot it out um, whenever I sort of have the opportunity. So on the left side, what we have is since 1984 through 2002, you could update this and continue to see these trends um, actually even more dramatically for the drop in poverty since 2002. For sub South Asia on the left, on, on the right, for Sub-Saharan Africa, green line is poverty rate um, that's plotted on the right axis and orange line is yield. So this is the combined yields across all stable cereals. Um, and so what we see again and again across time in the cross section of countries at any given time is that there's this inverse relationship between poverty and yields, right? You can't really tightly specify what the causal relationship is, although one can speculate, but we see again and again that uh, when cereal yields increase, poverty goes down, right? And there's a lot of work that shows that investments in the rural economy that increase agricultural product productivity, those gains are disproportionately um, likely to affect poverty, to, de to decrease poverty, right? Okay, so persistent poverty, big population in poverty in Sub-Saharan Africa, th that population is gonna persist through the next 20, 30 years and we see very stagnant yields. So if you wanna think about this relationship between poverty and yields, Sub-Saharan Africa since the 1960s, which is the sort of dawn of green revolution technologies and the dissemination of those technologies um, through 2011, which is when this graph start, uh, stops, but there hasn't been much change since then. Right? You see the effects of the green revolution technologies. You see big increases in, in uh, yields of staple cereals in all other regions of the world and then not a lot of movement in Sub-Saharan Africa, okay? So what I'm showing you is those, you know, sort of the, in, in the, um, you know, that, that Sub-Saharan Africa sort of stands out in terms of the stagnation in yields and that that yield stagnation has a strong relationship with a persistent poverty. So, yeah, so I keep thinking somebody's gonna ask me a question, but I, I think somebody's mic's just on. So, um, so why is that happening? Lots of different reasons that we see that yield stagnation in, in the region in Sub-Saharan Africa, but there's a, a strong hypothesis that has, um, uh, that, that part of what's going on is that the green revolution technologies, in particular hybrid seeds and mineral fertilizer were not, have not been adopted um, at the same, to the same degree as they have in other regions of the world in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, right? So you don't, this is plotting, uh, the amount of fertilizer being used uh, in metric tons um, uh, since 1961, and you don't see a lot of change in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is obviously a question that has an enormous uh, relevance for 
you know, structural, structural change in, in economies for, for poverty, as I've argued, for food insecurity, um, you know, for, for sort of the rise of the industrial sector, because you need food to sort of provision a, a strengthening industrial sector in your urban, um, uh, in urban parts of countries. So as you can imagine, lots of folks have, have attempted you know, to, to analyze and to explain why we see that persistent stagnation in use of fertilizer in particular. So there's lots of reasons. Um, I'm gonna give you a new one. I'm gonna talk a little bit about a new uh, one that we've been looking into, but it's important to think about what I'm about to say in the context of all of this other work, right? The work that I'm presenting sort of is, uh, you know, it probably is, is amplifying and, and, um, and complicating the other kinds of constraints that small farmers are facing, right? So there's high transport costs, uh, primarily related to poor infrastructure uh, in rural areas, and those high transport costs raise fertilizer prices. Um, high transport costs also lower the crop prices that farmers receive. Farmers have uninsured production risks, so fertilizer is a, a risky investment for them. There's limited cash and credit access. There's other kinds of complications. Right? So these are well-established reasons, and um, governments and other international organizations have implemented policies to try to address some of these. Um, sometimes in coordinated ways. So what we're thinking about, as I said, is a, a new way to think about this problem, which is fertilizer quality, and in particular what farmers believe about the quality of the fertilizer that they can buy in their local market. So we've done, I've done a lot of work on kind of what's happening with adoption of uh, fertilizer in East Africa. So I'm gonna talk about mostly results from Tanzania. Um, and we were doing work on soil testing there and ended up having a lot of conversations with farmers where they were telling us that they had these suspicions about the fertilizer that they could buy in the market. Um, so what they're worried about is adulteration, which means you take a bag, right? Somebody takes a bag of fertilizer and they open it up and they mix in other stuff. So you're getting diluted product, right? And that the, what they use for the dilution could be innocuous, it could be you know, sand, or it could be some kind of rock, or it could be something that would have longer term effects on your soil, like, like different kinds of salt. Um, so this is an anxiety that people are, are really forthcoming about. Um, uh, or sometimes they're just worried about manufacturing impurities or kind of just you know, cruddy stuff in the market. But what they mean is that the nitrogen is sort of less than it's supposed to be based on the manufacturing and the international standard. We have good evidence sort of linking what they're talking about. So here's sort of the kind of quote that you hear from people who've done a ton of focus groups. The fertilizer that can be purchased in the village is of poor quality because sellers can sell expired or illegal fertilizer mixed with other things that's not allowed by the government. This is from about five years ago, some work we were doing. And this is the, one of the input shops that you see in the market center. And they're, sort of, they're showing some of the bags of different brands that they have sitting in front of the shop. So we've, you know, we after we had these conversations with folks informally, and then we did a number of focus groups related to a different project, as I said, about soil quality, we got some money together and actually tried to understand what is going on and is the fertilizer actually bad. So we spent a lot of time focusing on what people were believed and really documenting those beliefs. So in Tanzania, this is from a sample now of about 500 farmers over two different studies. Farmers report that about 40% of fertilizer is bad quality. So we would say, imagine 10 farmers go to a market and they each buy a bag of fertilizer. How many of them are gonna get a bad bag, right? So on average, people say, you know, about four of those farmers are gonna get a bad bag. So it's a, that's a relatively high uh, um, kind of quality anxiety or relatively high belief that the fertilizer is bad. Um, so then there's some related work. Another team did some work in Uganda and they found you know, a similar sort of result, about 38% of nitrogen on average farmers thought might be missing. There's similar kind of work related to herbicides in some, in some contexts as well. So we also did a bunch of work with fertilizer sellers and we found that the sellers are also quite suspicious. So about 20% report suspecting that they had purchased adulterated fertilizer from their supplier, which is really interesting because they have a lot of different kinds of kind of reputational protections and they're kind of only buying from a few suppliers and if you really kind of document what they're doing to um, mitigate risks associated with receiving bad quality, you know, even so you've got about 20% of them saying, listen, I bought a bad bag. And one thing that we're looking at a little bit more is that there's a lot of range in what farmers believe about that fraction of fertilizer that's good. So this is, you know, we've got 
this is those five nephromids I just mentioned, right? So some people think that all of it's good, about 30% of the virus sample, but then you've got this really almost kind of normal distribution of, of you know, what other folks are believing. So there's a big range. And you also see this really interesting thing if you look at what people believe in villages, there's kind of herding within a village um, on a belief, which is quite fascinating. Okay, so we've also found that those beliefs are, dep are depressing the price that farmers are willing to pay. We've done some experimental elicitations where we look at what people are willing to pay for fertilizer and it's lower than the market rate when they have these kinds of beliefs. And we found that they're willing to pay almost 45% above the market price for tested fertilizer of verified quality, right? So these beliefs have real consequences for what people are buying um, in the marketplace, right? And how much they're willing to pay. Okay, so here's the really weird thing. The fertilizer is actually really good. <laughs> so I'm, well, I'm talking about urea fertilizer here. In longer presentations, I kind of go into what that means and, and why urea fertilizer is the most commonly used fertilizer among small farmers in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. It's um, these tiny little white prills. I don't think I have a picture in this presentation. It's all uniform in, in size and texture. Um, it's only nitrogen. It's 46% nitrogen by weight, so it's not a blend. So that's what everybody's using. When you say fertilizer, that's for the most part what a small farmer's thinking about. We've now taken more than a thousand samples. We've tested at the port, we've tested at wholesalers, we've tested at intermediary suppliers, we've tested at local markets. We've not found any problems, right? So that's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting because people have this anxiety. It's interesting because it is then affecting the price they're willing to pay. It's interesting because they're, want to, they're willing to pay more for you know, a verified quality product and sort of an experimental setting that we've run with real stakes where they're actually putting up real money, right? And it's interesting because their beliefs don't reflect the truth. And as economists, we, we think like over time, people should have beliefs converge to what's actually happening in the marketplace. Something is happening here that's making that hard or slow as a process. So we then, so this is a really interesting, I think, example of the way that research can um, bring you to a different question than the one you started with. So our first question was like, how bad is the fertilizer? It, our question now is, wait, why do people believe this? This is really interesting. Um, and so we're doing a lot of work to try to understand this. So we have some work where we're looking at, is it just really hard to learn about the quality because crop yields are so noisy? You have these like weather shocks, you've got you know, other kinds of um, uh, kind of stochastic processes that make it hard for you to actually infer what the signal is between applying fertilizer and the yields. So maybe it's just really hard to tell. Maybe you've got complementary underinvestment and other inputs because you think the fertilizer is poor, so you don't actually invest that much labor and you don't spend money on other things. And so um, you, know, you get a bad yield. Uh, maybe there, you've got farmer error and application or the kind of fertilizer. So a lot of folks think it might be that. Um, so, but we have a whole body of work now where we're trying to understand this. So then the last thing I'll tell you about before I end is given that it looks like this, these kinds of beliefs are pretty persistent and that they matter for what people are buying. We tried out an information campaign. We, we've done all these tests of fertilizer. So we made a bunch of flyers, we made a bunch of pamphlets, we randomly gave them out um, in about half of the market centers and we sort of paired that with some villages nearby. And we wanted to see, listen, can a credible information campaign about tested fertilizer quality, it's pretty cheap intervention, resolve information problems. And we're getting the data back, we're doing some analysis and it looks like it actually worked. So in particular, some a lot of farmers who weren't using fertilizer at all before, moved into the market and did purchase fertilizer when they got this information treatment, which is really interesting. So we will have more about that soon and we're gonna to try to supercharge it in a new study that we're doing. Um, but uh, that's sort of the state of the world right now. Thanks. Great, thank you, Hope. Yeah. That is really interesting and quite a set of puzzles actually. My Connection is unstable, but uh, if you can't hear me, let me know and we'll switch to somebody else being host. But there are a few questions in the chat. Uh, the chart on variability of beliefs, our equality is interesting. Is the variability correlated with behavior, actual purchases? Yeah, so that's right. So people, we do have some work on that. We're doing more because we now have these beliefs that we've elicited pretty consistently. We're getting a little better every time we do it. Um, in terms of also characterizing the uncertainty around the belief, which ends up being quite interesting. Um, so folks that are 
pretty confident that the fertilizer is good are the ones who have used it in the past. So they seem to have either learned or they didn't have the belief to begin with or something like that. But I think there's some really interesting spatial patterns that could be exploited here to understand sort of how learning might crowd onto a particular belief in a village and why. Great question. Great. Uh, and another question, uh, th this work is so cool. I can't help but think of the classic lemons market, the result of which yeah. is that everyone sells poor quality because right. consumers can't tell the difference. Your context doesn't align with that example because the fertilizer is high quality. Yeah. Why don't fertilizer so suppliers right? adulterate? <laughs> yeah, I will. I think what's interesting about this product for urea is it doesn't make economic sense, right? You have to, urea is super cheap for now, I mean, that could change if energy prices change, it's really tied to the price of natural gas. Um, and so you have to cut it with something that's less expensive than the thing that you're adulterating, right? For it to make sense, you have to do it at scale. Um, it just doesn't seem like a candidate product at this point. And so it doesn't seem like that's happening. Um, so we're watching that and we're thinking about that. When you get into other kinds of blends for fertilizers that are higher value, we think that might be really interesting. So I'll say we did, we've developed a, um, an app that, uh, that somebody could use. So it would be like an ag extension agent or a seller to take a picture of urea and to assess its quality um, based on a machine learning um, uh, algorithm that does uh, image classification effectively because it's visually detectable if you've got something mixed in there, that's not urea. That's what makes it an easy problem. Um, and so, the, you know, I think that's part of the reason it's just kind of, it's hard to do effectively and profitably um, if you're trying to do Great. it. So it does make it a really interesting product. Great. And so while uh, maybe, Peter, you can pull up your slides, but one last question while, while we transition, uh, Shadi asks, do we know what it, to what extent quality anxiety reduces likelihood of adoption? Yeah, I think that's where we want to go. I mean, the fact that resolving the uncertainty seems to bring people into the market um, and seems to be bringing in folks that weren't buying it before suggests that that might be an impediment that matters. But I think even with the data that we already have, we could do more with that. It's a great question. Cool. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Thanks to Hope for getting us off to a great start. And so our next speaker is Peter Christensen, an assistant professor. In the Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. And thanks so much for having me. Uh, this is going to, at first, seem like a very different uh, topic than the last one that we heard uh, about from Hope. But I hope to convince you that it's actually quite related. So I'm going to be telling you uh, about what we can learn, or what I think at least, we can learn from ride hailing experiments about sustainable transportation challenges in developing countries. And so what is the relationship to the, the last talk that we just saw? Well, for those who there are um, you know, multiple escapes from persistent poverty in developing countries, uh, and one is to increase agricultural productivity, but for those who might be you know, living and working in, in rural areas and in the ag sector and can't increase uh, their productivity, many have been for the last couple of decades, and this is expected to ramp up and continue, are moving to cities, right? So these uh, sustainability challenges in rural areas and in urban areas in developing countries are very much intertwined and so, um, you know, it, here in CEOs, we're doing uh, work on all aspects of these problems. So we expect, the UN at least expects that 2 billion people will be moving into developing world cities by 2050. Uh, this is particularly uh, expected to occur now between 2020 and 2050 in, in Africa, at least in percentage terms. Although the majority of the, in, in terms of levels is going to continue to be uh, in Asia. Oops, sorry about the um, sequence here. Uh, the economic opportunity that, this, uh, that these urbanization trends uh, present are going to depend on how policymakers manage growing demand for infrastructure and urban public goods. These are uh, you know, public goods in, in urban areas that are experiencing rapid growth are typically congestible. We can think about you know, roadways, that's what I'm gonna be talking about today in public transit, uh, but we can also be thinking about that in terms of other types of infrastructure that is providing uh, safe, clean drinking water, 
uh, schools, et cetera. And uh, to the extent that you know, we have large uh, agglomerations consuming these goods, we're also going to have to deal with the pollution externalities that arise. Uh, as well as potentially, as well as the equitable distribution of these public goods. The transport sector in, in developed world cities uh, is the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. And many believe, uh, projections are suggesting that emissions trajectories in uh, developing country cities are, will largely depend on whether transport patterns crystallize around private versus shared transportation. So as we're thinking about those transportation challenges, we have to keep in the back of our mind that uh, spatial frictions matter, right? Transport costs uh, affect the, the productivity of cities around the world, as well as the emissions implications of uh, existing technologies that we're using for, to increase mobility. So changes in the price of transportation can have wide ranging impacts, especially during this rapid urbanization process on this very spatial organization of cities, right? The organization of housing markets, the structure of labor markets, migration behavior, and of course, pollution and emissions. But changes in the price of transport won't affect everyone equally. Differences in both underlying preferences as well as non-monetary costs in particular accessibility and levels of personal safety on public transit have already been shown to have significant impacts on labor market constraints as well as other types of economic outcomes in developing country cities in particular. So enter ride hailing services, right? The, these markets have already arguably changed transport markets uh, over the past decade or at least particular segments of, of the income distribution in developing country cities. We, we might be familiar with one or two of these firms, but there, there are literally tens uh, now that are operating around the world. And what are they actually doing? They're basically reducing information and matching frictions. That's the way that we're thinking about the impact of these types of services. The first generation is taxi-like services, but most of these companies are also working on shared transportation services, uh, private buses, et cetera. And so we expect that this is going to affect the way that uh, transport markets evolve in the developing world in particular, especially because many of these uh, firms are targeting developing country cities where there are very large, large markets for transport services. They may increase Theoretically, public transit utilization as a complement or reduce it as a substitute. So we, a very important policy question is what is the impact of these growing markets for, uh, for ride hailing services, these matching markets on public transit utilization? And how might regulations affect the way that they, uh, the way that they impact their impacts on public transit utilization going forward? They have been largely unregulated uh, over you know, the last decade or so, and, but now uh, uh, over 50 cities in, uh, the, in devel the developing world have instituted bans or taxes and other types of regulations. Uh, they can make private tra travel more accessible, especially in, developing, in the developing world where car ownership has high fixed costs. So we see in many developing country cities the trend in private vehicle ownership increasing dramatically. Now that's going to interact, those trends are going to interact with these new types of markets, which potentially we're going to be uh, regulating in, in different ways. They can also importantly provide additional safety and accountability in many contexts, at least relative to existing taxi services. And in some cases, in, uh, in, in uh, cities that have unsafe public transit options uh, relative to public transit. So that's something that we're going to be having in the back of our mind in terms of why we might see demand for these types of services uh, going up. Now, here's a, a very important policy point. Engineering estimates, which we can take with a grain of salt, but currently is currently all we have 
suggest that autonomous vehicle technologies could bring down the cost of ride hailing services, these uh, uh, types of, um, uh, of matching services and tra uh, ride, hailing, um, yeah, ride hailing markets cost by 50 to 85%. Okay, so as we're thinking about the, the joint trends in, uh, in urbanization in developing country cities, as well as the potential for large reduction in cost for private transport services, we need to be thinking about externalities as well as potential benefits and, uh, as we design uh, optimal policy. So unfortunately, it's been very difficult to anticipate changes in transport demand, particularly in develop developing country cities because of empirical and measurement challenges, which have limited our ability to study the effects of, uh, of price and policy changes in transport markets. Transport prices are almost never randomly assigned. Uh, just observing responses on a single transport mode, public transit or um, private car usage, doesn't tell us much, uh, enough about the overall effects of a policy change or a price change. Data on total mobility at the individual level are extremely rare. So we believe that experiments with ride hailing services and when paired with careful data collection can help us overcome some of these challenges and to estimate underlying demand parameters that, uh, that will help us understand potentially how mobility and demand for private transportation uh, services is going to change going forward. I'm gonna present, just show you some quick results from a, a recent experiment in Cairo, Egypt which is one of Uber that we ran in collaboration with Uber. Uh, this is one of Uber's largest markets with over 4 million riders. It's also a sprawling megacity with limited public transport options. There's a single central uh, subway line that serves a portion of the city, no public bus map, and it's one of the uh, world's, according to most metrics, uh, 10 most congested cities. Importantly, harassment in public transit in Cairo is a persistent risk, especially for women. And so here on the right-hand side, I'm just showing you the results of a baseline survey that we, uh, that we ran uh, with participants in our study that I'll, that I, that, that I'll show you in just a minute, uh, where we're just asking people about their baseline mode use. So here you can see that uh, the, the um, majority of participants, at least in our sample, are using either the public bus, these are Uber users, so they're using already using Uber, uh, private car, and then with less than 10% using this relatively restricted metro system uh, in Cairo. As I mentioned, uh, Cairo is, uh, or uh, Cairo, harassment in Cairo is very real. It was recently rated uh, the most dangerous megacity uh, for women. So what do we do? We run an experiment with uh, over 1,300 Uber riders in Cairo, Egypt. Uber sends an in-app text message to a random set of active riders. So this, you have to have ridden in order to be part of our sample, used Uber services at least once in the last three months. That's how we define you as active, in inviting them to join a study on mobility patterns. So of course, the sample here is not gonna be representative of the population of Cairo. These are going to be relatively younger, uh, about the average income is about 30% higher and, uh, and, and relatively more educated uh, individuals in Cairo, but certainly representative of the Uber market itself, which has more than 4 million riders. So interested uh, riders are going to click on the link uh, and message to sign up. We then implement a baseline survey to learn about their transport patterns and ask them to turn on uh, a Google time, the Google timeline application on their phone to enable personal tracking we're going to collect data from them on their total kilometers traveled per day using uh, this, this method. Eligible individuals are then assigned to a cohort and randomized into three groups where we're going to reduce the price of these services to observe how their, their behavior responds. Uh, the first group has a 50% price reduction for three months. 
The second group, a 25% price reduction for three months. And the third group, no change in price. We're then gonna continue to collect follow-up data over the course of the 12 weeks, three months of, of this study. And all respondents are given Uber credit for responding to our surveys uh, to, to reduce uh, potential attrition. So here's the main takeaway in terms of utilization, increases in utilization in uh, response to a large price reduction on ride hailing services. So not surprisingly, we're gonna make these services cheaper. People are going to use them more, but the question is how much more? We uh, observe, and so here basically you're looking at the blue um, set of uh, uh, ridership over the 12 weeks of the study on the x-axis. The blue circles and triangles represent the control group, the red, the 25% treatment, and the green, the 50% treatment. We're, we're observing here much larger elasticities or behavioral responses to price reductions that have been found in other um, cities, which have been the studies uh, of which primarily occurred within develop, the developing countries, especially the US. We're observing that on average, the 25% price reduction induces about a doubling of Uber usage and a 50% price reduction induces about a quadrupling of Uber utilization over the course of the study. And we see within this 50% group, a distinct difference between patterns of mobility and Uber utilization for men and women and a change across time, which to us suggests some evidence of, uh, of learning and adjustment. So takeaway number one, these ride hailing services, if we're using for policy, uh, uh, information that we've collected from studies of gas price changes and other types of um, uh, policy changes in other markets, we may be dramatically underestimating the potential for increases in uh, private vehicle travel on, on ride hailing services that may be induced by technological change. Number two, uh, takeaway number two, we find that a 50% price reduction increases the total mobility of our participants on average by 42%. So people are not only using uh, Uber more, but they're also traveling much more. Our takeaway here is that uh, that latent demand for mobility, at least in Cairo and likely other developing country cities like Cairo, uh, is high. And that, and we find that these uh, large price reductions translate to even into even larger mobility effects by in, uh, inducing some complementary travel on other modes. So we should be thinking very hard about the potential for increased mobility in developing country cities and how we and the optimal regulations in it, as uh, those uh, as as ride hailing markets become a bigger part potentially of the, of the picture. We also look at mode substitution. Here I'm just showing you uh, very quickly our evidence on substitution, which is suggesting that there isn't much action on the Metro, but bus users are shifting over to Uber. And to some extent, taxi users are as well. But from the perspective of, of regulations and private vehicle travel, uh, this bus substitution is important. So our takeaway number three, Uber is acting as a complement and as a substitute for other modes of travel. Here we find, interestingly enough, that despite relatively large reductions in the probability of taking a, a bus trip within our sample in the high treatment group, overall bus use does not decline. So in cities where there is a big concern about the revenue impacts of price reductions on ride hailing services, this evidence is suggesting that actually people are traveling more, not really changing their, their net uh, use of bus services, even when they, they substitute uh, away. We then look at impacts on personal safety. And here we ask uh, riders, participants in our study about how safe they felt on yesterday's travel. And we see evidence of a substantial increase in perceived safety on those trips, all coming through uh, female participants. 
And we find that those very female participants who were riding bus at baseline are substituting away and having larger effects on their overall Uber usage. So we're gonna to need to be thinking about uh, how as we uh, consider regulations uh, in the private transport sector and potentially on these ride hailing platforms, we're gonna be needing to think about uh, non-uniform effects by gender, particularly in cities where uh, women feel unsafe on public transit. So I've just shown you some evidence of overall safety uh, uh, increases. And this suggests the potential for, if we're thinking about a uniform tax potentially on ride hailing services, which have been implemented in several cities already, this could affect the overall mobility of female riders if outside options are unsafe. So the obvious implication there is we need to increase the safety of Cairo's buses or in options uh, uh, public transit modes in developing country cities where, where women might be substituting away. So just to conclude, uh, our, this study has shown us that latent demand for mobility is much higher than we, we might have expected. Um, reductions in prices on Uber translate into large effects on overall mobility, not just substitution away from other modes. They could have large effects on congestion and emissions externalities, as well as yielding large benefits. And that's really what we want to consider as we're thinking about optimal transport policy. We estimate that the social benefits from a 50% reduction in the price of Uber services would be equivalent to about just over half of a percent of Cairo's GDP. But there are large external costs as well uh, in terms of congestion, pollution, and accidents, which are you know, about two thirds as large as the benefits. Um, finally, safety matters and new data on uh, total mobility can help us to better design transport policy by understanding some of these fundamental parameters that underlie the demand for mobility in uh, developing country cities. Thanks. Great, thank you, Peter. That was a great talk, really interesting stuff. Um, we're we're gonna go ahead because it's it's time to go move on to our next speaker. But maybe while uh, Catalina brings up her her slides, you could answer just the first question. So, wondering if you've looked at any impact of this on female labor force participation through increased mobility or increased perceived safety? Yeah, that's a great question. We did look at this, uh, but we're somewhat constrained in what we can say because of the three month period of our study. So we don't actually see evidence of large impacts on uh, female labor force participation, uh, but we think that in the longer run, that could potentially just be due to the, 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 the timing of our, of our study. So we need long run studies. Great, thank you for that. Um, and so uh, Kevin also asked a question, but maybe you can respond to him in the chat. And if other people have questions and you'd like to answer them, that can continue in the chat. But to make sure we don't run out of time for our third uh, excellent speaker, um, uh, I'd like to introduce Catalina Herrera Amanza, who is an assistant professor in the Department of ACE. And she's gonna be talking to us about natural disasters in developing countries. Take it away, Catalina. You're muted. For the invitation, I'm very happy to share my work at the mini talks and thanks for everybody to uh, join in uh, this uh, session. So I'm gonna uh, talk about today, natural disasters, mitigations and human capital in developing countries. So this is related to the work of uh, Hope and Peter in the sense that we are gonna now talk about what we can do to make more sustainable uh, the world. So. Why this issue of natural uh, disasters and human capital is important in developing countries. So let me start thinking, why is this issue important? Well, natural disasters, think about extreme rainfalls, extreme droughts affect disproportionately developing countries. And this is gonna be even more exacerbated because climate change can increase the frequency and intensity of these natural disasters. And this is even more complicated than, uh, in developing countries because there is a lack of adequate infrastructure and policies to mitigate these shocks. And this vulnerability will make, uh, it, it's, it uh, translates in a barrier to reduce poverty in these developing countries. 
So um, why this is important as well in terms of the education outcomes that this is what I'm gonna be talking today. So children are the group at most risk from uh, weather shocks in developing countries. And studies have shown that adverse early life events such as extreme rainfalls, extreme droughts can have long-term consequences. And they, these, you know, these events can create poverty traps in future generations. So to show you an idea, if for example, a child grows in poverty and then her education, her or his education is uh, interrupted, then there are barriers for this person to have a, a productive life, to get better opportunities in the labor market, and then probably the trajectory of his or her family later on will be also into poverty. So this is what uh, economists we call poverty traps. So the idea here is that these natural disasters can affect kids when they are in early childhood, and these can have later on consequences for uh, when they are adults. So this issue is also important because as I mentioned, it, there has been a large um, empirical evidence documented that there are long-term effects of natural disasters in early childhood uh, that can affect later human capital in developing countries. And uh, just to give you an idea of human capital here, we are talking about education and health. So uh, climate change is not only uh, affecting agricultural uh, productivity and also uh, you know, other economic sectors, but it's also affecting education and health, particularly among children. And despite that we know these studies, we don't know much about what type of interventions can help us to mitigate these negative effects of natural disasters and protect human capital. And precisely this is what I'm going to talk today. Uh, it's a study that we conducted uh, in the Philippines. And the question that we have was, can the effect of natural disasters on human capital during childhood be mitigated in the long term? So what we did was to analyze whether effects of super typhoons, these are going to be our natural disasters, can affect the school age children and be mitigated later on by a school infrastructure program. And now our context is going to be uh, in the Philippines. So we are going to talk about long-term human capital, understood as education, um, secondary school completion, years of schooling. And we are also going to look at uh, labor market uh, outcomes, such as occupation and migrations overseas. Uh, and probably this I will just mention at the later. Uh, later at the end of the talk. So the idea today is just to tell you what type of research we can do uh, around these questions and the what, you know, what type of data we do and how we measure this type of impacts. So our going from Tanzania, from Cairo, now I'm bringing you to the Philippines. Uh, so this is a lower middle income country. Uh, so just to give you an idea, the poverty rate today is around 23%, $3,500 is the GDP per capita. And uh, uh, the Philippines is located in the Southeast Asia in the Western Pacific Ocean in something called the uh, Typhoon Belt. And then it's the most typhoon uh, affected country worldwide. You are wondering probably what is a typhoon. It's a fast moving tropical storm formed over the oceans and caused physical damage via intense winds, heavy rainfall and ocean surges. So in 1987, there were two main super typhoons called Betty and Nina that hit the Philippines. Um, I just put just a visual um, a, a scale of the Saffir Simpson a hurricane wind scale because these two super typhoons fall in the category five and then they had like a highest wind scale and catastrophic damage in the Philippines. And despite that the Philippines is visited all the time uh, for, by this you know, uh, typhoons, uh, Betty and Nina were among the top five strongest and most destructive typhoons registered since 1947. So it was a, a sizable, uh, you know, destruction uh, that affected the country in this year. So what happened later or two years later, there was a program uh, called Typhoon Resistant School Building and Instructional and Equipment Project. And this program was funded by the Japanese government. And it was a very interesting program because it was an in-kind program. 
that the Japanese helped uh, the Philippines. And the program, what they did was to build very quickly typhoon resistant schools. And the idea here was to kind of prevent the disruption of uh, schooling given this massive destruction of the typhoons. So we, the, the, this program prioritized the areas, the provinces, think about the states that affected, uh, that were affected by these super typhoons. But there were other criteria in place, such as that, uh, I don't know, the, the, the space where the uh, schools needed to be built, that the municipalities, need, uh, the municipalities needed, uh, didn't need to uh, have other uh, alternative uh, funding to build the schools. And all of these other criteria made it that not all the provinces affected by the 1980 uh, typhoons received the program and some unaffected municipalities did receive the program. So we have a setting where first we have this massive chalk of natural disasters, and then we have the rollout of a program that will allow us to explore these differences in the geography and the program allocation. So uh, what, type of do, what type of data we need to explore this type of questions uh, and in this context? Well, we use the 10% integrated public use uh, series of the census. This is um, a, a census in 2000, and it allows us to measure the long-term effects of uh, these shocks uh, because it's 2000. And remember that in 1987, there was this typhoon and in 1989, there was this program. So this is almost 10 years later. Uh, sorry, somebody has a question? Probably that somebody is uh, unmute. And then uh, 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 the program was yeah. uh, rolled out at the municipality level. Um, the, the, the program was uh, rolled out at the municipality level. And then uh, we used this information from the Department of Education. And finally, we have information of the data uh, where the provinces were affected by the typhoons. And we have some warning system uh, signals based on meteorological conditions such as wind, pressure, and rainfall. But we also have uh, more specific data uh, that uh, records the typhoon's trajectory, wind, and pressure. And it's going to allow us to uh, kind of calculate the municipality level of measured typhoon intensity. So we have, so just you have in your mind, we have the socioeconomic information from the census and we have at the state level these warning signal systems and then we have at the municipality level that is kind of a county level we have a more precise information of the geocoded data so this is the type of data that we need to analyze uh, these research questions so then what if we put it in a map this map visualize uh, like at the type of information that we have. So this is the Philippines and these are the 1000 municipalities included here. And what you see in different colors is that we have some variation of uh, municipalities that only receive the program versus other uh, municipalities that were only affected by the super typhoon. And then there were other municipalities that were affected by the typhoon and received this program. So this is using our warning system uh, data. And then we wanted to know if this overlaps with the geocoded data. So the key message here of this you know, visual uh, a graph is that the municipalities on the 1980 super typhoon, these municipalities, most of our municipalities were on this track. So either if we were able to specifically measure at the municipality level, the intensity of the disaster, or if we have the state level data, we were, uh, we were capturing what happened in the 1987 and then the rollout of the program later on. So well, we have the questions, we have the data. So now, how do we measure this impact? So what we will need is that the same cohort of kids, of individuals, that were affected by these natural disasters, by these super typhoons, are later affected by or benefited by the program. So this is a timeline. And just keep in mind these colors. It will help us kind of go through the results. But remember that in 1987, there were these super typhoons that affected these, these young kids and older kids. And then in 1989, there was this secondary school program. 
So what we use is that there were kids that we are gonna call to young cohort that are from nine to 11 years old. And then these young kids are gonna be compared with kids that were too old to be benefited from the program because they are finishing high school, right? And we are gonna trace these cohorts later on in the 2000, almost 10 years later, to analyze their educational outcomes. So what we are using is kind of a quasi-experiment, what we call as an economist quasi-experimental evidence, where we are using the geographic variation of these super typhoons that is kind of random because we don't know exactly what is gonna be the trajectory of these typhoons. And then we use the fact that in 1989, the young cohort was fully exposed. Kids from nine to 11 were starting the secondary school while the old cohort had little or no exposure to the program in municipalities with and without the program. So basically this is what we call a, a, a triple difference model that I, I, I don't want to have in, a, I don't want to go into details, but just for you to have an idea that we are using, using the differences in cohort exposure in and out municipalities overlapping with the geographic variation of the super titles. So we have the data, we have the methods, so now what do we find? So first, remember this uh, first uh, part of the, um, uh, design, we are going to use uh, the variation of having uh, having been affected or not uh, by the super typhoons. And what we find is that on average, young cohort individuals exposed to super typhoons were less likely to enter and completed high school. And therefore, more than 30 years later, they have around 0 0.3 uh, less years uh, of education. And this result is consistent with other studies that have shown that natural disasters decrease the individual's, uh, the individual's education. And then later on, we want to know what happened with the program. So in the absence of any other shocks, on average, what will have happened with this program? So the school building program improved education. And on average, these kids who benefited from the secondary school accumulated more years of schooling after 10 years of implementation. So in this case, we are just analyzing the program, not taking into account the, the differential. But remember that the, the original question was what we can do to mitigate these negative effects. And this is where we are gonna um, use these three differences with and without the program across cohorts and with and without the typhoon. And what we find is that young kids affected by the super typhoons who benefited from the program were able to recover from the negative effect of the natural disaster. So what you are seeing here in this graph is the additional effect of the program on these populations that were affected by the natural disasters. So this, we are interested in this additional effect of the secondary school building program on those who were affected by the natural disasters, because as I mentioned earlier, the idea is to think about policies that help us to mitigate these effects on uh, natural disasters. So in summary, what we find is that natural disasters indeed negatively affect education. 10 years, uh, and this is why we talk about the long term, because it's, it's not after, right after the chalk. Uh, the secondary school building program uh, almost entirely mitigate the detrimental effect on the super typhoons. And I think that this is a result that can help policymakers to think of um, uh, interventions that help protect uh, mainly kids from these uh, natural disasters. And something that we find interestingly is that these differential effects on the program on education are associated with other outcomes uh, among these individuals, such as working in a high school or, or uh, in a high skill occupation, working in the non-agricultural sector and uh, the increase in migration overseas. So these additional gains also are translated in the labor market. So some final remarks. Uh, so public investments such as supply side programs to improve school infrastructure have the potential to mitigate ad adverse effects of natural disasters. And this is at, at the core of sustainability and more important is that we can prevent or help prevent to be in these cycles of poverty, as I mentioned earlier. And definitely we need more research on other policies that could remediate the well-established detrimental effects 
of negative shocks on human capital. And if you want to see more details, please refer to this uh, uh, paper. Thank you very much for your attention. That's great. Thank you so much, Catalina. Uh, any questions from the audience? So while, while people think, I, I have a quick question. Um, I don't know how expensive the school program is, although school building sounds expensive. Are there other, is that expensive? And are there other, you mentioned other policies, are there other policies that could be implemented to do something similar? So we didn't do a cost benefit analysis and this, uh, this program was an in-kind program. So that is a very rare thing. So basically they built the materials, they <laughs> ship materials from Japan to, to the Philippines. So we don't know well if that is gonna, you know, it's got, if, if that is gonna, I mean, we cannot compare with other interventions in terms of a cost benefit analysis. What I can tell you is that other uh, policies that, uh, are well known to protect human capital are, for example, conditional cash transfers, uh, where you give uh, transfers to mothers, conditional that the kids uh, go to school. And interestingly, these type of conditional cash transfers have not been uh, uh, proved to mitigate the negative effects of rainfalls, which is surprising because conditional cash transfers are pretty successful in developing countries, but they do not seem to for example, mitigate effects of early rainfalls such as El Nino in Colombia or in Ecuador. Interesting, interesting, okay.